there's weird things that go on in the superstitions to the point where the hair on the back of your neck stands up. As you're walking through these trails and these washes, you literally feel like there's someone or something watching you. Well, it's now been four months since a Phoenix man went missing from Weaver's Needle Vista over in Tano National Forest. You're talking a, a pretty healthy 25-year-old with no food, no water, no nothing. I mean, he just pretty much vanished without a trace. What is up, Iwu crew? On August 12th, 2020, 25-year-old Kaiman Welch, who went by the nickname Kai, accompanied his uncle to complete some AC work in Tortilla Flats, Arizona. After a long day of arduous labor, they decided to stop by a nearby landmark called Weaver's Needle, a popular nature spot in the Superstition Mountains in Tonto National Forest, east of Phoenix. Kai had wanted to get a look at the beautiful view of the setting sun over this scenic backdrop. The two pulled into the visitor parking lot and walked out to the viewpoint. After a while, Kai told his uncle that he wanted to get a better view of the sunset and walked off into the distance, presumably scoping out an ideal vantage point. He went southeast from the parking area, heading down the trail towards Weaver's Needle. His uncle started back to the car, but when he turned around, Kai had completely vanished from sight. Kai's uncle waited and waited for the young man to return. Just as the last of the sun's rays dipped lower into the sky before leaving the wilderness dark and quiet. But still, his nephew didn't return. Kaiman Welch was gone. He was last seen standing by this park sign at around 7.15 p.m. After sunset, his uncle got worried because he hadn't come back yet. So that's when he notified authorities and their search ensued that night. And I guess they had tracking dogs out and they lost scent pretty nearby. We were alerted to this case on January 11th of 2021 when a woman named Mindy reached out to us saying, now five months since he's vanished without a single trace, we and other volunteers still searching for him have spent countless hours hiking hundreds of miles in the area he was last seen. Not a single clue as to what happened to him. Everyone we talked to is clueless that there's anyone missing in the area. Mindy lives in Arizona and is an experienced hiker, one who frequently goes out of her way to help search for people who go missing in the area. She's been putting extra effort into this case. Because Kai's mother lives in Wyoming and therefore can't visit the area as much. Mindy explained to us how she got involved in the search for Kai. Uh, so basically on August 13th, my family and I were on our way to the lake nearby where he went missing. And we noticed there was, you know, a, it looked like a, a search party was out there. There was a helicopter in there and several sheriffs around the the area. So when I got home, um, I actually looked to see what was going on because we often volunteer for search and rescue parties and came across his uh, disappearance. And initially due to the heat, you know, at that time of year, it, it was 115, 117 for weeks. So, um, they did not want any volunteers out there because they were a little fearful that, you know, something would happen to one of the volunteers. So basically they were using their search party, um, which was of course a lot smaller than having volunteers out there. And then they were using drones and, and things of that nature. Um, people on horseback um, from other areas pretty much did a pretty extensive search, what looks like to be approximately a mile, mile and a half around the actual little rest area that Kai and his uncle had stopped at. You know, at, at no time 
did we see birds of prey in the air or circling? I mean, he just pretty much vanished without a trace. Mindy shared this overhead route of the path Kai took on the 12th, from Tortilla Flats all the way to Weaver's Needle Vista, after video footage confirmed the journey Kai and his uncle took that day. Kai's mother, Rhiannon, also spoke with us one-on-one -on -one and told us a bit about her son. Growing up, he was always really social, very energetic, very happy. He's just overall a loving guy. Like, I don't know a single person that doesn't have a good thing to say about him. He, you know, is a tattoo artist and um, has tattoos and everything. His heart is, is big. He's very, very, very loved. Rhiannon emphasized that Kai is a good man with a perfect record and has never gotten into trouble, had straight A's in high school, and didn't struggle with mental health until the months just preceding his disappearance. She created a Facebook page not long after he went missing, titled Bring Kaiman Home. There she posted, He's not just some punk kid covered in tattoos, as I'm sure many assume based off his looks. He is my son, a brother, a grandson, a nephew, a cousin, and a damn good friend. Apparently, people had been assuming that this photo used to show what Kai looked like was a mugshot, when in reality, it was just his driver's license picture. Sadly, Rhiannon said at the time of Kai's disappearance, he was struggling with severe depression and wasn't in a good mental state whatsoever. Unfortunately, he did not have insurance, making it harder to access assistance, but he was seeking psychological help directly prior to his disappearance. Rhiannon explained, He really loves his tattoo family down in Arizona. He said he'd found his new home. His anxiety was pretty high, but that's because he tends to underestimate himself way too much. But shortly before his disappearance, Kai had taken a hiatus from his passion for tattooing. We asked Rhiannon how he got into the AC business with his uncle. Um, that was actually a new thing. He was taking a break from tattooing just because he was having some really major social anxiety. You know, it kind of came out of nowhere. He had a little bit of it here in Casper, Wyoming, but when he moved to Arizona, it just seemed to kind of escalate a little bit, and we're not really sure why. But I think the onset of the pandemic and then other things going on, you know, in our family world that, that were kind of stressing him out. And over time, he um, just seemed to kind of fall into a really dark depression. But he was fighting it well. He was setting up appointments. A lot of things were lined out to kind of get him, you know, in the right place. Um, but it, it seemed pretty sudden that he started battling, as he called, crippling social anxiety. So he just, he couldn't focus on his art the way he wanted to regularly through a lot of this. I had my own um, issues I was kind of going through with medical stuff and a lot of personal things on my end. And so we were kind of leaning on each other as each other's rock to kind of get through everything. And it seems like he was, you know, really pulling through and doing well up until the last couple of days right before he went missing. That was when he really seemed to, to be defeated and, and like he was really having a hard time, you know, being chatty and open. He just kind of shut down a little bit. I'd say around August 10th, so about two days before he went missing, our conversation kind of shifted a little bit. We did attempt to reach out to Kai's uncle for an interview through Rhiannon, but unfortunately did not receive a response. We can only wonder what Kai was thinking or what his behavior was like in those last few hours before he went missing. Rhiannon explained through this Facebook update how Kai wasn't using his phone before he disappeared because it had been acting up. Because of this, Kai did not have his phone with him when he walked off. He wasn't a phone talker. Texting wasn't really his thing. It was usually messaging. So I know a lot of people have been like, well, why wouldn't he have his phone? But just you have to know Kai to understand. He's not your typical 25, 26 year old. He really, really liked kind of diving into his art and 
focusing on stuff like that and not, not, you know, chatting on his phone all day. So. Strangely, she also wrote about how some of Kai's search history showed that he had researched that area, and she asserts he knew how dangerous it would be to wander off because he's camped in the desert previously. Sadly, Rhiannon says that the coronavirus pandemic of 2020 really worsened Kai's mental state, and the final texts he sent her are heartbreaking to read, as he mentions suffering from crippling social anxiety and explains, I just feel like everyone's telling me to be positive and it's making it worse. On the morning that he went missing, he texted his mother saying, I'm not doing well. That was the very last message that I got and I had tried calling or some reach outs that, that he didn't respond to, but that uh, message he sent me was very early in the morning and he went to work with his uncle later that morning. So the, the message was like at, you know, 1.30 a.m., 2 a.m., super late. And then he was at work with his uncle the next day. He had been working, so, you know, wasn't too weird for him to not reply right away. And this, this uh, job with his uncle was a very spontaneous thing. It wasn't planned. His uncle Brian had asked his dad, Brandon, if he wanted to go work with him that day, just, you know, kind of looking for a sidekick for the day. And Brandon declined and Kai was like, sure, let's, let's go for it. And so he kind of, on a whim, jumped in and went. You know, he has that spontaneous side. And so, yeah, he opted to go that day. So that's another factor that's kind of confusing is he didn't know that he, he had no premeditated plans of going to the location they were at. There was no chat with anybody aside from, you know, family that he was even going to be up in the Superstition Mountain area. So, These details have led some to assume that Kai may have planned to go missing that day, and possibly that he wanted to end his life. Detectives eventually gained access to Kai's Facebook account but weren't able to find any conclusive evidence that would help to immediately find him. But there were some telling internet searches discovered on his computer that gave an insight into his state of mind. We looked through his laptop before we gave it to the detectives and found some searches that he was uh, looking into. He wasn't looking into like how to commit suicide, but he was looking into ways to help cope with thoughts of suicide and he had appointments lined up so he was actively doing the work which it takes a lot of strength to do that I think that's something that more people men and specifically you know have a hard time kind of really getting in tune with their emotions not all but you know some men have a hard time with that and I um, his entire family backed him on that supported him just really believed you know it takes a lot of courage to say you know what I'm not doing well and I I want to see if I can get some help. But to Rhiannon, things just aren't adding up. I don't think he would go this long without talking to family, especially his mom. At the time I just had surgery, I was struggling, and he was my rock. I don't think he would have intentionally left. She asserts that he wouldn't have made it very far in the dark, and he wasn't prepared for a hike in any way as he didn't have any food or water provisions with him. But before we delve into any more theories, let's take a look at the timeline of the search and rescue efforts, starting from the heart-wrenching moment that Rhiannon learned of her son's disappearance. Yeah, I got the very, very late phone call. I'd say midnight one, I think, is when um, I got the phone call. And at that time, we weren't sure how serious it was because again it only been a couple hours but the next morning it really started hitting like I was stressed out all night but I was like okay you know it's not unlike Kai for him to do his own thing so I'll just see if hopefully some good news comes through by early morning I just I, I could feel it in my heart like something wasn't right I'm like they still haven't found him like this is you know, overnight, this is this is a big deal. And so I spoke with the Welch family, and yeah, I 
I wasn't sure when to leave or what to do or, or what, but we initially just instantly knew we were going to be heading down there. It was just a matter of when, and I asked them, I'm like, do you feel like it's time for me to be there? And they said yes. The roller coaster ride that was the search for Kai can best be seen through the Bring Kaiman Home Facebook page chronology. August 19th, the page reads, We are entering day seven. We have had search and rescue teams out as often as they possibly can be, every single day. These forces include men, horseback, dogs, drones, helicopters, infrared cameras. We are exhausting our resources in this search. It's a lot of terrain, you know, and we're, we're pretty much at times on hands and knees under cactus and rattlesnakes and <laughs> tarantulas and <laughs> you name it. It should be noted that this area of Arizona reaches high temperatures of up to 115 degrees Fahrenheit, 43 degrees Celsius, which is what was reported on the day Kai went missing. Exposure to the elements would be a real risk factor, as well as heat stroke. But investigators are stumped because Kai should have been somewhere along the Weaver Needle Vista Trail, a public and commonly used 6.4 kilometer hike loop that sees frequent traffic. When we started, we knew that the the sheriff's department were kind of a, in a tight search area. So we actually started further away. We went about three miles because it was getting dark. It would have been completely pitch black out there. The moon, there was really no moonlight out there that night. If he had lost his way, there were several vantage points that he could have like walked up and you clearly see the city lights of Apache Junction. And then apart from that, even about a mile and a half in, I can still hear traffic from that roadway, from the State Route 88. That That's what's just mind boggling because yeah, you can get turned around over there, but especially at night, it would be virtually impossible to like not be able to find your way back. The Facebook page detailed that search and rescue had been looking for Kai since 5 a.m., pushing new territory and pushing their own limits. Because to their frustration, the temperature was hitting record-breaking highs, which left little room for being out on foot. Things were looking bleak and the next urgent message on the Facebook thread read, Everyone send your good energy. Today is critical. The search continued, but only came up with dead ends. Soon law enforcement started to consider other possible outcomes. Authorities rechecked footage over and over, while the search and rescue crew retraced their steps, even dealing with a frightening lightning fire at one point. On the 20th, we had a storm come through um, during monsoon and uh, lightning actually sparked a fire in the superstitions. That put a little bit of a damper on continuing searching uh, for the department. And um, to my knowledge, I mean, they, they searched clear up until they couldn't anymore because of the threat of the fire in that area. Meanwhile, Family members and those close to Kai were interviewed, just in case, and cleared of suspicion. Donors started pitching in resources to help the cause. Rhiannon, Mindy, and others posted flyers to local convenience stores, food missions, homeless camps, and on countless online pages in a bid to get the word out. On August 22nd, Rhiannon returned to the Facebook page with a shocking update, but surprisingly, it wasn't about Kaiman's disappearance. She instead came to say that the father of Kai's little half-brother, Caleb, had passed away. Caleb is nine years younger than Kai. Um, Jason Smith, which is Caleb's father, passed away nine days after Kai went missing. Jay really wanted to be there. It turned out to be that his cause of death was natural causes, but he had been through a lot and he'd been through multiple back surgeries and was on a lot of medications that were not doing him any good. So yeah, that, that, that was mind-blowing happening nine days after. That was just 
like I thought I was literally in a dream just trying to wake up and just completely shocking. <laughs> As the devastating blows continued to come, Rhiannon lamented, My son has lost his father and his older brother is missing all within just over a week. This horrible nightmare continues. In the face of all this tragedy, Rhiannon finally discovered one sliver of hope, writing, We found a message on his phone where Kai was implying he felt bad for going a few days and not replying to his mom's message, as he was talking to one of his best friends. A few days. Here we are 12 days later. Nothing. He would never go this long without talking to the people he loved the most. The development does raise the question, would Kaiman ever purposefully go missing, knowing that his family would be worried sick with no explanation? Perhaps this element does lend some credence to the theory that this was all a tragic accident, and it serves as just one more reason to keep on looking. But after two weeks went by without a trace of Kai, search and rescue backed down. The case was then moved over to a missing persons investigation, and the helpers from out of town reluctantly said their goodbyes. Rhiannon shared her overwhelming emotions, writing, The idea of hope to be shut down again by a whole day of hard work yielding no results, it wears on one's body, mind, and soul. Around this same time, huge fires would strike in the superstitions, closing off Lost Dutchman State Park completely. This greatly hindered any continuing search attempts, and although Rhiannon felt utterly confused and helpless, she held strong to the fact that zero trace, no body, and not even any clothes had been found. It meant that Kai could still be alive out there. As week four came and went, Rhiannon said, We're trying to stay positive, but it's harder to do each day. People started sharing their stories of Kai, celebrating the positive aspects of his life in an attempt to raise spirits. Rhiannon herself shared a tattoo that Kai had given her on Mother's Day. One high school friend remembered drinking coffee and blasting death metal at 7 in the morning before classes started with Kai while another friend shared some metal music clips that Kai had been making in his free time, saying, In usual Kai style, he didn't think much of his work, but I loved it. Others spoke about how good of a friend Kai was, how he was a good listener, a deep thinker, and someone who always went out of his way to help others, even calling him a big teddy bear. One man said, one of my favorite things about Kai is how intimidating of a man he is. But when you get to know him, he is so kind and so full of life. Another individual said Kai pulled them out of many pits of depression. After reminiscing, Rhiannon got back to business, soon sharing a video of the Superstition Mountain Range, saying, There is a cactus every few feet, so you won't make it far off trails. This doesn't show how truly rugged this whole area is. It was 115 degrees on this day and pure hell. I still don't believe he's in there. On September 16th, police sent Rhiannon a message letting her know that they spent the day flying a drone over the search area, covering a thousand acres in a grid search pattern. They gathered about 4,000 photos and promised to look through them for anything unusual. However, it seems nothing useful has come of it. All of these stunted efforts have left Kai's loved ones wondering where in the world could he be? And what happened to him? Still, Mandy and Rhiannon pushed ahead, determined to never give up. And soon, Mindy came forward with an intriguing new theory of her own, explaining, We came across pictures of a mountain that resembles Weaver's Needle, and that mountain is Battleship Mountain. We feel it may be a possibility that Kai mistook another rock formation that resembled pictures he saw of Weaver's Needle and proceeded to that route. We are thinking he may have proceeded to an area a bit deeper than originally expected slash searched. This direction of travel would have led him into the Hackberry Spring area. 
and even possibly further northeast into the Labarge battleship area. We are unsure if there was water flowing in the Hackberry area on the day he disappeared. Could Kai have mistaken this landmark for Weaver's Needle and gotten terribly lost going in the wrong direction? Rhiannon wasn't sure if Kai would have tried to make the ambitious trek to Weaver's Needle in the first place. But we were up there, we watched, you know, the sunset, which that, that was my first question, was the sunset is the opposite direction of Weaver's Needle. So if he wanted to get a better view of the sunset, why would he go, you know, towards Weaver's Needle in general? Like, I just... Just kind of thinking back to all of it, if, if he just wanted a good view of the sunset, there's a big difference between that and then, hey, I'm going to go hit that spot way in the distance, but seven miles away. Other theories pitched by worried followers included the possibility that Kai made it back to the 88 and then hitchhiked from there. Theories like this remind us how important it is to spread Kai's story and image all around the country. If he's somewhere out there, after all the months that have already passed, he could be anywhere. After fruitless months went by with no luck, on December 10th, Rhiannon posted a photo of the eerie enshrouded mountains, saying, I think Mindy and I are starting to believe the SUPs and entire area have a mind and personality of their own, since there is always some bizarre sh** going on. We couldn't list all of the weirdness that's happened if we tried. They don't call these the superstition mountains for no reason. And the more people that I speak to about this tell me, you know, there's weird things that go on in the superstitions. And I mean, during our search, we've found abandoned camps where you could tell that people are living out there. As you're walking through these trails and these washes, you literally feel like there's someone or something watching you to the point where the hair on the back of your neck stands up. And I've hiked these mountains for years, and so has my husband with me, but it's just <clears throat> now the more, you know, I hear about, you know, I guess there's been drugs found out there during searches. There's been, you know, in the previous years when people go missing out there, but they're always, the people are always found and there's usually some type of evidence somewhere, you know. Um, I even actually thought about setting up a trail camera because only at that spot, people keep taking down the, the missing poster. And I don't know whether it's, you know, people, the, the do-gooders that are, you know, just wanting to, uh, you know, clean up or whatever, thinking that, oh, it's an old poster, it needs to come down, not realizing he's still missing. But on the other trailheads, nobody touches them. They're the same posters that, you know, we initially put up. So, like, I'm, I'm curious, like, if, if maybe we recognize, you know, somebody taking that down or it, it's just, it's so weird. And like I said, the, the police kind of seem like they've got the, eh, he'll turn up. Somebody will find him eventually, you know. Researching the Superstition Mountains we hope to gain some insight into how others disappeared or were found. And the information online tells a dark story. President Emeritus of the Superstition Mountain Museum, George Johnston, says that more hikers disappear in the superstitions than any other mountain range. But still, Kai wasn't hiking. His excursion should have only taken a few moments at the very most. Either way, it is reported that an average of four to five hikers disappear or die in the area every year. In fact, only three days after Kai went missing, another hiker, George Wesley, disappeared in Telegraph Pass on the other side of Phoenix. Wesley's body was found the next day a mile away from the main trail. Experts cite sheer drop-offs, deep canyons, extreme temperature fluctuations, and even dangerous wildlife as possible explanations for this troubling trend. Many people also believe in the lore of a lost mine in the area called Lost Dutchman's Gold Mine. 
Not only is the elusive treasure trove of legend suspected to be within the Superstition Mountain area, but many versions of the story include Weaver's Needle as a vital landmark for explorers to locate the mine. Over the years, many adventurers have embarked on quests to locate the mysterious mine. Some don't make it back alive. Still, with its status as arguably the most famous lost mine in American history, this dangerous outcome doesn't stop new enthusiasts from making the trip. And one estimate claims that 9,000 people annually have gone in search of the mine since 1892. The mine is named after a German immigrant who allegedly discovered the mine in the 1800s, but kept its exact location a secret. In 1931, the legend gained notoriety when amateur explorer Adolf Ruth vanished while searching for the lost Dutchman mine. Disturbingly, Ruth's skull was found six months later with two bullet holes straight through it. When the tale made national news, the strange story only served to spark more interest in aspiring treasure hunters. It was reported that Ruth's son had learned about the mine from a man he saved from a jail sentence, and when the son passed antique maps onto his father, Ruth set out, determined to locate the gold mine despite being 66 years old and needing a cane to walk. Although locals warned him of the treacherous terrain and unbearable heat, the stubborn Ruth pushed on. After his skull and later his remains were found, so were his belongings, but the maps were missing. No bullets were missing from his pistol, leading to the belief that he was murdered. Ruth's checkbook contained a message claiming that he had discovered the mine, and he even wrote detailed directions before ending the note with Veni Vidi Vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. A slew of other deaths have occurred in the area as well. In the 1940s, the remains of a prospector searching for the mine were discovered, though the body was missing a head. A 1945 book contained an account from the author claiming that he had a run-in with a sniper while seeking out the landmark. In 2009, a 35-year-old man disappeared in Tonto National Forest, and when his car and campsite were located, it came out that he had been obsessed with finding the lost Dutchman's mine for years. His body was found in 2012, wedged between a crevice. In 2010, yet another three hikers went missing in the Superstition Mountains. For one of them, it was his second time needing rescue. Just a week later, though, the search was called off and the men were presumed to have died from heat exposure. In 2011, three sets of remains were uncovered, theorized to belong to those unfortunate adventurers. In addition to this lost Dutchman lore, other factors play a key role in these disappearances. The Arizona Republic reported that Maricopa County is responsible for a disproportionate amount of search and rescue efforts. In 2012, a hiker named Kenny Clark was found dead after five days off the trail and with an empty water pack. While we can't say for sure that Kai's disappearance stems from these particular factors, understanding the strange history of missing persons in the area is certainly intriguing. Mindy did look into the dangerous mine shafts nearby, but to no avail. The thing is, is out in that area, during our search, we have now found four vertical mine shafts, one that was 30 feet deep and in the dark could be very easy, easy to trip over barbed wire and land in there, but we've searched it with cameras and there was nothing in there except for some boards. There's three other ones, one that's not that deep, but he would have had to hike up on a hill and that'd be pretty hard to fall in. And like I said, we searched that one, but just because we found and searched four of them, now our concern is, are we missing? There might be more, or with the fact that we've had a drought recently, did 
possibly a void open up because there's less groundwater and he might have been walking and fallen in that or you know we have fissures here in Arizona you know sinkholes that open up and and stuff like that that are about 12 miles or so away from where he went missing so there's that possibility which would probably make sense because we haven't found a shred of clothing we haven't found you know like he's wearing leather boots so you would think even if animals had attacked you know at, at some point those boots would still be there one detail that Rhiannon said often gets messed up in this case is that people claim Kai was an experienced outdoorsman. That is incorrect, and that has really hurt this case, I believe, because a lot of people assumed, well, he's experienced, he knows what he's doing, or, you know. He is, you know, one that could walk 10 miles in the Arizona heat, no problem, but he wasn't a hiker. He didn't go hiking every weekend, or he may have done some, you know, mild camping and, you know, minor things like that, like with his dad in a camper, but it wasn't a passion. It wasn't like something he <laughs> found joy in necessarily. He loves nature, but definitely not like outdoors, like hiking up the, especially the superstition mountains, but those are insane mountains, not that out of character for him. It is unclear why so many news outlets have been reporting this incorrect detail but Rhiannon wanted to clear it up, as it further shows how unprecedented his actions were that day. Mindy told us how much of an anomaly this case is in her eyes. Well, this is actually the longest one. Like, usually, you know, the, the ones that we have assisted on, they're found relatively quickly, either, you know, alive and well or deceased, you know, but they're found very quickly. And this one, it's like, first, I, I was kind of disappointed with the media attention that he got, or lack thereof. There was one little blurb about him being lost in the superstitions, and people just kind of chalked it up to, basically, he was stupid for being out there. It's 117. Because the way that they portrayed it was he was a missing hiker, and an avid outdoorsman. So naturally to those who actually go out and do this often for hobby and, you know, pleasure, they they would think, oh, well, you know, how experienced could he be if he went out hiking in 117 degrees with no food or water, but he was not hiking. He just went like to get a better view according to what his uncle stated. I mean, he's he's physically fit, you know, he's he's not like super athletic or anything, but you're talking a, a pretty healthy 25-year-old wearing black pants, black boots, black shirt, and a black hat with no food, no water, no nothing. In the end, the investigation is virtually no further at the five-month mark than it was on day one. And that's the hardest part of all. Rhiannon once said, Kai has touched so many people, and all who know him know he's as special as they get. She addressed a note to him on her Bring Kaiman Home Facebook page, saying, Kai, if you're running away from the world, I totally understand. I know you're struggling, and it was absolutely heartbreaking to see that you were watching videos on YouTube regarding taking your own life and wanting help so desperately. Your feelings are valid. But that isn't the answer. There are options, and we will do whatever it takes to get through this. Please, just come home. Both Rhiannon and Mindy shared their disappointment with how insensitive people can be to the serious nature of this case. The amount of people on social media that are just downright cruel, it's another challenge. Like, the family doesn't really want to share much anymore because as soon as they do, they get, oh, he, you know, the, the cats ate him, or oh, the Apaches grilled him, you know, just cruel, cruel. I mean, I can't even, some of the stuff that they say, it's like, it's not enough that their child is missing. It's been brutal because some people, they don't watch the article or read anything and they just make comments. It's like, you know, family does watch this. And as a mother that has a son missing, it's 
hard to see some of the, the ignorant statements that people will say. And yeah, I, I've got a lot of people backing too. So not to like, but yeah, he there, he has so much love. It, I hope people can just be understanding that this is just a very bizarre situation and we're trying to cope with it as best as possible. Authorities told Rhiannon that everyone who has ever gone missing in the area has eventually been found, alive or dead, and that the longest anyone has ever been lost in the Superstition Mountains up to this point was seven months. As of January 2021, Kai's been gone for five months. Rhiannon is now looking into the possibilities of enlisting help from HRD dogs and handlers underground, underwater sonar operators, and private investigators. I've written down 13 possible situations that could have happened, and I can't cross one off at this point. Like, we can't mark a single thing. And, I, and I'm and i being open-minded and even thinking outside the box, because in a situation like this, when your son is missing, you kind of start to, like, wonder a lot. You start to believe, you know, anything is possible at this point. Like. He did somehow find a way to, you know, escape. He's very smart. You know, I'm sure if that was really what he set his mind to, he could do that. But knowing that he had plans that evening, plans the next day, appointments set up, nothing in his conversations with people indicated that he wanted to just disappear other comments that he made like I would go into some therapy but some of the programs he was looking into would require like 30 days of inpatient or you know just some extreme help to kind of get him on the right track and he said I don't think I could be away from my family for 30 days so unless there was a major trigger of some sort that we can't figure out that really made him want to go it's just yeah we we really have no idea <laughs> Kaiman is a white male in his mid-twenties, who is six feet tall, 200 pounds, and has brown hair and hazel eyes. He was last seen wearing a black Ghostbusters t-shirt, black jeans, and army-style boots. He has full-sleeve tattoos on both of his arms and short buzz-cut hair. Kaiman was last seen August 12, 2020, at around 7.15 p.m. at Weaver's Needle Vista Viewpoint near State Route 88 and milepost 203.5 in the Tonto National Forest. If you have any information or leads that could help bring Kaiman home, please contact the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office at 602-876-8477. Yes, if, if anybody has any information about anything at all, even if it's just a, a hunch, obviously one that maybe has some realistic ideas behind it please you know contact reach out if you know of anybody that might know something and also if people are out hiking in in those mountains if they find anything that could be linked we would really appreciate a reach out and also that nothing be touched so that they can um, investigate more if needs be but it, from what i'm hearing there's been tons of hikers out there and no trace, so. If there's anything to take away from this case, it is the importance of acknowledging mental health issues. Especially during the rough times of the pandemic, it is vital to check on those we love and make sure that they are doing okay and getting the help they may need.